Hello, everybody. It's Joe Pernesti, and I want to welcome you to another edition of the Building Construction Awareness Project on Fire Engineering. Uh, today is a very uh, special uh, program in the fact that when we started this, and hopefully many of you watching this uh, saw our first one where we talked about Main Street Type 3 buildings, uh, the overall goal of this committee or this group is to look at building construction as a whole and, and bring back um, the, the desire and the, uh, the importance of building construction in the fire service. So our first uh, fire engineering uh, video we did, uh, uh, if you haven't seen it, look that up. But when we started this project, we also agreed that we would bring uh, you, the viewer or the listener, uh, more detail about events that have shaped our fire service that have uh, had an impact. And many of you watching this um, may be aware of what we're going to discuss today, but if you're not, please sit back, um, enjoy, and take this in uh, of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, hopefully when you're watching this, it, uh, it'll be released uh, on the anniversary of really uh, before 9-11, was one of the darkest days in the New York City Fire Department's history. And that uh, took place on October 17th, 1966, uh, in a collapse that killed every rank but captain uh, in the New York City Fire Department. You had probationary firefighter, uh, firefighters, lieutenants, um, uh, battalion chief, and also a deputy chief. So our goal today is to discuss what took place on 23rd Street uh, 50 some years ago, it's 54 years uh, this year, and uh, bring you a little, all of you, a little bit more information and how to bring that into your, your daily activities as a firefighter in your area today, why that is important. Uh, so we have a wonderful panel here um, today and uh, we'll start introducing them. Our first uh, panel member, James Johnson. James, uh, if you would uh, introduce yourself uh, and tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I'm James Johnson. I work up in Vancouver. I'm the token Canadian for the show. Uh, big building construction nerd, really enjoy it. I have a history of working in the trades and um, yeah, just looking forward to, to diving into this fire. Um, this fire is definitely something that's influential for me um, learning lots about it early on and uh, excited to talk about it. Also excited to hear um, Chief Tracy's um, kind of take from it as well. And as well as, uh, as well as Glenn Corbett, guys that are from the area have been around for a long time. So <clears throat> just looking forward to participating. All right. Thanks, James. Uh, Paul Dan's back. Paul, please introduce yourself to everybody. Chief, uh, I'm the fire marshal in Rutherford, New Jersey. Uh, been in that position since 1986. I've uh, been in the fire service since 1977 in Rutherford, which is a volunteer system. I remain uh, as a volunteer firefighter there. I did 10 years as a chief officer there. Also a fire instructor up at Bergen County Fire Academy. Um, one of the subjects that I, I teach and actually study a lot about um, is building construction. So this is uh, really a subject, this fire is, uh, is a uh, fire, a subject that I have studied. And I think it's important, we'll talk a little bit more about later about the fire services history and uh, uh, understanding the, the role and the significance of, of, uh, of our history. All right, thanks, James. Uh, Glenn, Glenn Corbett, please introduce yourself, everybody. Yeah, hi, thanks, Chief. Um, Glenn Corbett, I'm also in Bergen County along with Paul, uh, the other end of the county, Northwest Bergen. Uh, also in the fire service since 1978. Um, currently, I'm uh, still teaching over at John Jay College in New York City, up on 59th Street, uh, fire science, uh, graduate emergency management program, what have you. Um, uh, the other issues I think that are relevant today are, for me, are, um, again, what Paul mentioned about the historical fires of the past. Um, you know, we uh, at Fire Engineering, where I'm technical editor, you know, we've, we've, pretty much written most, written up most of the fires since 1877, pretty much read everything after Chicago. But this one actually, we don't have a lot on, on, on the website uh, in terms of an article back in 66. So this is an important fire, as Paul pointed out, this is the largest loss of life in the, the career FDNY's history. 
up until 9-11. So there's a lot of lessons to be learned. And uh, uh, Chief Tracy, who we'll hear, we'll, who we'll hear from in a moment, uh, basically um, has studied this fire in great detail and can, we can learn a lot from it. So things that are particularly relevant today, which we'll, we'll discuss. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chief. Lex Shady, introduce yourself, please. Uh, my name is Lex Shady. I'm a firefighter in Central Ohio. I'm the new kid. I've been on my current department for about two years and volunteered for a couple years before that. Um, when I got started, I realized how little I knew about building construction. So I kind of became a student of it and it's just become a passion. And I appreciate the opportunity to uh, get to discuss and learn more about this fire today, so. All right, thank you. And last but not least, we have a special guest, Chief Jerry Tracy, retired FDNY Italian Chief. Jerry, introduce yourself. And uh, again, thanks for coming on. Thank you for the privilege uh, to be included with this uh, group of profound individuals. Lex, uh, I want you to know every one of these firefighters is a mentor to me, by the way. Um, I was just having a conversation with somebody uh, just the other day to say I like to hang around with smart people. It's similar to if you want to look skinny, hang around with fat people. But <laughs> different. You, to say, you want to know something and you want to learn as much as you can about uh, building instruction become an aficionado of building construction if you're going to, uh, let's say, survive in the fire service. Uh, it's so true. Uh, and what I began to discuss uh, earlier before we were recording, I guess everybody sees that uh, <clears throat> aerial view of Manhattan, and that's from the tip of Manhattan, showing uh, the New World Trade Center and the Battery, battery Park. Uh, and then you're looking all the way uptown, all the way, and you can't see it to the left would be the George Washington Bridge. Uh, and basically seeing construction that took place, and some of it from the 1800s all the way up to now it's 2021. Uh, and to say, oh my God, the changes, the innovations and designs, uh, you know, people would say uh, the future, well, the future is here and now. On 58th Street in Manhattan, they're building buildings that are being referred to as super and mega tall. They're above uh, 300 uh, or 600 meters, 900 uh, and 1,000 feet. So the challenges are great. And to work in a, a city such as this, or anywhere USA, anywhere Canada, Vancouver, and that's uh, a challenging place. Uh, I respect the uh, uh, Brother Johnson so much uh, on what he's uh, giving and what he has to offer the fire service. Uh, they have probably the tallest uh, timber, uh, engineered lumber, uh, timber building in the world right now, if I'm not mistaken, right? 18 stories, is that correct? Uh, so that's the tallest one in the world. There's, there's others being planned, but to say your city was on top of their game in that the design of that building, they collaborated with the fire service so that the fire service was, let's say, satisfied with whatever protection systems were being put in that building, both passive and active. It, it would be that you're a role model to the fire service worldwide. So to get back to uh, the city and its layout, uh, as all cities are, they're laid out with streets and avenues and boulevards and things like that. New York happens to be rather unique in that going back to 1811, the streets north of Houston Street, if you will, Houston uh, is from Houston Street south would be Soho, south of Houston Street, Tribeca, the triangle between uh, Canal uh, and Broadway, whatever, going south all the way to the Battery. You look at those streets and they're sort of uh, off on angles and things like that. But when you look north of that, all of Manhattan, everything is east and west, avenues north and south, and they were designed with a purpose. They were designed because they expected Manhattan to be completely occupied and they needed a system of design that they could sell property lots. Lots would be so wide and so long and that every street was to be 200 feet wide. And why am I bringing this up? Well, we're gonna be talking about the event that happened on 23rd Street, a fire uh, that actually communicated from a building on 22nd Street. And if you'll notice in, in this map right here, you'll see that's 23rd Street. Oops, 
excuse me, I'm gonna go back. That's 23rd Street and 22nd Street is the next block over. Those blocks are 200 wide, but the property lots are 100 deep. Why am I bringing that up? Well, we talked about fire operations in buildings such as that. We're called upon uh, to one fire extinguishment, search for life. If a building lot is 100 feet deep, well, does the building itself take up the whole lot all the way to the rear? It could be, and we have uh, buildings that are referred to as brownstones, uh, row frames, which are built of uh, brace frame construction. Uh, Manhattan, many of the buildings are factory type that may in fact go the full 100 feet to the rear of the property unless there's a rear fire escape. That being said, there's a rear fire escape and some of those fire escapes could be five feet wide, rather large. That would mean there would be an areaway to the rear of the building, meaning that particular building does not go the full 100 feet, may only go 90, giving you a 10 foot areaway in the back so that the rear fire escape, people could come down, come to an areaway and then go to an alleyway or something like that to find egress all the way out to the street. What I'm alluding to is that if we're going to enter these buildings for fire extinguishment, how much hose do I need to reach the rear of the building? And if I'm gonna be searching for life and or searching for fire, how far do I have to walk to get to the rear of the building? Because that became an issue at the 23rd Street fire, this particular fire right here. We're looking right now at the intersection of 23rd Street and Broadway, and the building in question that the fire extended to from a building on 22nd Street was that building right there. It all started, and before I move on, we have to remember those firefighters, and Glenn brought it up. This was the most tragic event that happened in the history of FDNY. 12 firefighters uh, tragically lost at that fire, and it covered all ranks but the rank of captain. Uh, Deputy Chief, Battalion Chief, uh, Deputy Chief Riley, Battalion Chief Higgins, uh, Lieutenants uh, from Engine 18. And you know what? I've been given many gifts in life, and I was given the gift of becoming the commander of Engine 18 that became Squad 18. Uh, I was given that gift and privilege to form Engine 18 into a squad. And by the way, Andy Fredericks was my first pick uh, I was given uh, the privilege of picking my crew and Andy Fredericks was uh, amongst that. These are those firefighters that were lost that day. This is the particular building. Now, for some of you, uh, I don't know if it's obscured because of uh, uh, our pictures uh, to the right, but it shows a side view of the building on 22nd Street, which was a brownstone. Smoke coming out of the basement door. Uh, I guess if you've read the, uh, uh, the transcript on this, uh, there was a residence living on the top floor of this building. The first floor and basement were used uh, as a uh, frames, frames to pictures and paintings and things like that. Uh, you could bring your poster painting or pictures there. They would uh, frame it for you and they would finish the frames, which meant that there was lacquers and paints and things like that, volatiles, if you will, uh, being stored both in the basement first floor. Uh, but you'll notice you're looking at that building and there's an extension on the rear of that building. Uh, I may have mentioned earlier that brownstones themselves are not 100 feet deep. Uh, they, because there's usually a backyard. So from the front of the property to the rear may only be 80 feet and then there would be a backyard. I'm showing the fact that there's an extension because when the units first arrived on 22nd Street for a report of a fire and smoke because the residents on the top floor called it into the fire department. It was a four story brownstone. Now when we arrive, and I'm throwing up a red flag, when we arrive, our typical procedures are that a ladder truck will raise the aerial uh, and or if it's a tower ladder, they'll raise the bucket and they'll put a firefighter on the roof if it's an isolated building. If it's not an isolated building and there's a building next door that's contiguous, a firefighter would enter the exposure and go up to the roof level and cross over. But what is the duties of that 
firefighter roof, it's ventil uh, vertical ventilation, but these are the eyes and ears of not just the incident commander, everybody on the fire ground. As that firefighter approaches the roof and he looks over the rear and he sees an extension, well, guess what? That's that uh, painter who used to go on TV and show us how to paint that's being obscured by our pictures. But that firefighter is painting a picture for everybody on the fire ground. Be advised, there's a two-story extension to the rear. And by the way, the residents on the top floor, before they left that building, uh, the husband had looked out the rear and he saw smoke coming from the skylight of that extension. So that roof firefighter going to the roof would have seen the same thing. He would have called out to the incident commander, you know, and I believe it was uh, three truck uh, got to the roof first. They would have put it out on the radio if they had radios, because this was 1966, not everybody had radio. But somehow you have to communicate, there's a rear extension, there's smoke coming from the rear extension. That throws up a red flag. It's information to the incident commander. Now the call comes in because an automatic alarm was transmitted from the building on 23rd Street. In other words, a smoke detector. And that comes out on the air, but yet the incident commander in front of that building, he's not hearing that. His aide, if he's in the car, or if he has a citywide radio, he's hearing that information that a box is coming out on the next block. That has to be communicated because guess what? That's another red flag. Everybody has to be on the same page with information. This is so important, all of these things. And the fact that there's smoke in that building, well, why is that? There should be firewalls, brick walls, foundation walls. It's a red flag because there has to be, with what it's telling us, there's a compromise somehow, some way. And we would find that out to say, yes, that's another red flag. Well, here you see the buildings, different buildings. And we're looking at the building on 23rd Street. Now it is, 100 feet deep. So those units, and I believe Riley, who was the deputy chief on 22nd Street, was hearing all of these other transmissions and the fact that the, there was uh, smoke. They transmitted a second alarm. He had second alarm units. And I believe uh, they also dispatched another deputy chief uh, from the first division. I believe his name is Hay, H-A-Y. And he was taking command of, let's say, the 23rd Street side. Uh, and it also brought in, let's say, engine 18. It also brought in engine 33, which was commanded by the lieutenant, the young lieutenant, Vinnie Dunn at the time. And it would be Vinnie Dunn and Lieutenant Priori of engine 18 uh, were ordered into this building. Uh, I believe the address is 6 each 23rd Street that housed the drugstore, a lingerie uh, store, and a candy store. And Engine 18, along with Ladder 7, were ordered into, let's say, the first floor uh, of the drugstore. Now, I believe uh, Three Trunk was also ordered now to come over to the 23rd Street side with a young lieutenant with a, with a famous name. And I believe he was a legend on the job already. His name is Royal Fox. Uh, to go down into the basement of the 23rd Street building to check for extension because they had a, a, a slight smoke condition on the first floor. And they went down there, I believe, with five engine, which is another single engine on the east side. And they only went, and they may not have realized the depth that they had, let's say, navigated, if you will, to the rear of that basement. They only really walked 65 feet because the occupancy in the basement and the first floor of the brownstone on the 22nd Street side, which was this here frame, uh, picture frame manufacturer uh, and finisher and things like that. They actually broke through the wall of the building on 23rd Street and took 35 feet of that basement. And then they put up a cinder block wall so that when seven, uh, excuse me, three truck commanded by Lieutenant Royal Fox and five engine went to the rear, they thought they were at the rear of the basement. So why I brought up the fact that this, the buildings are built on a grid and you have to know the depths of your buildings because also the roof man going to let's say the 23rd street building that firefighter would go up to that roof and he could also put it out you know this building's 100 deep so that everybody working hears that transmission 
So then those units downstairs will have to say, did we walk 100 feet? They only went 65 feet. And they gave the radio report that there's no extension. We have a little bit of fire here. And in time, uh, this building on 23rd Street was, for our purposes, was considered ordinary construction, but the floor joists were dimensional lumber. They were three by tens. So that was heavy fire that burnt them away. And those units, engine 18 and seven truck were above that fire. And they were standing on basically what was a terrazzo floor. A terrazzo floor is cement and marble uh, chips, if you will, mixed. Uh, and it was probably at least four or five inches deep. Uh, Glenn would know better than I, but it didn't transmit heat from below. So these firefighters did, had no idea that they were standing above a fire that was degrading three by tens that eventually failed and these firefighters fell into the depths of hell. God bless. Glenn, would you like to add to this? One, if uh, <clears throat> uh, Chief Tracy if, uh, or, or Glenn, if, if somebody has that picture, um, I believe, uh, or Lex has it too. Lex, pull, that, pull up that picture from the New York Times. The New York Times did an illustration of this, uh, of the collapse. Um, or maybe you have it, Paul, Jerry? I don't know that I, I, I may have it in, a, in another program and I'll see if I got the- If not, Lex has it on her computer. Okay, well, let's give Lex the floor. You wanna pull that up, Lex, real quick? Yep. Okay. Outstanding. If, if, if Jerry or Glenn want to, you know, you can talk on this a little bit, or anybody actually. This was, um, the New York Times had put this, posted this when they did a story, I believe it was on the 50th anniversary of the fire. But this gives a pretty good overview of what Jerry has uh, done a great job in dis uh, describing. Um, does anybody want to try to or elaborate any more on this based on this little graph here for um, those watching here that may not know much about the fires is the first time they're learning about it? Yeah, I, I'll just throw a couple points out here. Um, you know, as, as Chief Tracy mentioned before, um, the fire initiated on 22nd Street in that um, picture frame facility. And of course, there was a, was a fairly significant fire load in the basement to begin with. Um, one of the key factors here in this diagram is if you look in the very center, it says old wall and new wall. Um, what ended up happening is, as the chief mentioned, is that the uh, art dealership on 22nd Street extended their basement into formal, what was formerly the basement of the, the complete basement of the drugstore. And so you had this old, whole additional piece of, of real estate that was that from, you know, no, again, not knowing how deep you're going to the building, you wouldn't think that one building on one street extended into underneath the building in the basement level of the other. But here's, here's the key point. When they removed that old wall, they removed a load-bearing wall, a portion of load-bearing wall. And, you know, that's a significant issue in any building. So I think the takeaway for us today is this, is that, um, you know, if, if you're dealing in a situation where, where uh, a contractor is doing renovations or whatever, and the issue of a load bearing wall comes up, basically that's, that's three red flags in a row, right? That you need to stop what's going on, bring in a structural engineer to verify the work being done is, is, is gonna, not gonna compromise the building. And that's exactly what happened. It didn't compromise it the day they took the wall out, it compromised it when it was under fire attack, basically. Um, and this has happened, I just mentioned a couple of the places. Uh, back in 1981, there was a young guy, along with myself, uh, who went to John Jay College as undergraduates. And uh, we were up, at, up on 59th Street at school, uh, taking our classes, and we walked back down to the infamous Taj Mahal on the Hudson, the Port Authority bus terminal. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And uh, what did we find down on 9th Avenue uh, around 40th Street was the entire Washington Beef Company building into the street, basically. Uh, that young guy is known to many of you today as the champ, Mike Champo. He and I went to school together, one with John Salk and a whole bunch of other guys. And uh, so on the way home, we were going back to New Jersey. We found this building in the street. And again, at the end of the day, 
uh, one of the most significant issues here was there was an expansion from one building into the next, right? That they basically compromised the, the uh, load bearing wall to allow for a larger expanse of storage area. Um, and so, you know, again, the same issue here. And that, so this is a lesson for us today. These buildings are still around, right? And really for that matter, any load bearing wall is, is, is a red flag for, um, for, um, for, uh, for us to pay attention to basically. So uh, that's the big one. I guess the other one uh, Paul talked about here in a little while is the terrazzo floor. I just, one quick point about that. Terrazzo floors, of course, are incredibly heavy floors. Um, but they're not unlike co poor concrete floors and laundromats and other kind of places where similar kind of conditions exist. Um, just remember that, um, that a thermal engine camera is useless in a situation like that to determine the fire, uh, the, uh, fire uh, conditions in the basement. We know that, for example, you saw that with the UL studies several years ago. We, just, we figured out how long it took LVLs to collapse you know, in a basement fire, uh, you might remember that they use a thermal engine camera up with those two mannequin firefighters uh, on carpeting. There was a very minimal rise in temperature from that floor through the camera. And you know, the last example I got is, is Arnie Wolf, the lieutenant in Green Bay, Wisconsin, which uh, I used as a case study at the beginning of the wood frame chapter in, in Frank Brannigan's book. Um, Basically, the same situation happened to him. He was in that building for less than a minute with his other three firefighters. Two of them went, uh, another firefighter went along went one direction with him toward the bedroom and the bathroom. Another went in the living room. And within a minute, uh, Lieutenant Wolf was killed. He fell through the floor. That was a substantial floor in a relatively new building. I think the house is only a few years old, a single family home. But the key was is that it was a built up floor of not just the floor joists, in this case, LVLs and I believe there's lightweight wood trusses there, but also a, a series of layers of not only wood, but thin layer of concrete, radiant heat panels and tiles on top of that. Wow. So even if Lieutenant Wolf had had a camera there that day, that wouldn't have told them what was going on down below. So even though this, this fire we're talking about right now occurred in 1966, even if they had thermal engine cameras, that would not have told them with that camera what was going on, not only in the fire conditions, but where the fire was. So anyway, that's a Glenn, couple. A bearing wall compromise. What year was it in Boston, the Hotel Van Dome? 1972. 1972. Right, yeah, 70, yeah. So, same and that compromise, by the way, was done decades earlier. Exactly. So this, and it was, and of course, the, the collapse was probably, and my guess is, looking at the evidence, my guess is the collapse is not only precipitated by the, by the fire, but primarily by the water that was yeah. used to put the fire out, um, because that collapsed at the Vendome, and if you ever get a chance to go up there, there's a really nice memorial to the, to the firefighters who were killed that day. That's Boston's largest loss of life in terms of firefighters, right on Commonwealth Avenue. They've got a wonderful memorial uh, right there for it, but that, again, was another situation, and I think, Jerry, you would agree with me that that even though a lot of people consider building inspections to be mundane and what have you and not desirable in the fire service, the fact that you know it's so important to know about buildings, not only, not only how it's laid out and the occupancy, but a little bit of its history too, right? That in this case, correct me if I'm wrong, Jerry, that uh, the buildings department approved this change in Wonder Drug. Yes. Because they were uh, supposedly the Department of Buildings considered uh, these two buildings one. But, but you didn't treat them as one, though. You none of well, us would think this is one building. No, oh but God. evidently there was no communication between buildings and the fire department. Exactly, and and that's that's part of uh, what I wanted to touch on a little bit too is that this the fire the art gallery uh, in reading the Board of Inquiry report had a fire in the late fifties. There was a fire in that, that building on 22nd Street and they renovated. And then I think that wall was taken out like five or six years before the fire. But the two, they didn't talk. And you know what, that was in the 60s. I guarantee you in my city and probably a lot of cities, there still might be that gap in communications in, in you know, the building department and the fire department. 
And um, that, that's still prevalent today. I'm just kind of curious if anybody wants to add to that a little bit that, you know, how, uh, again, this, is, this, this program's about building construction and, and renovations and that. If anybody has any uh, thoughts on that about getting those two departments to talk or, or to discuss, because this was five years before, it says in 61, it was, it was moved north and the fire department didn't know about it. And they did inspections on this building before that fire too. And after that wall was moved. Yeah. Well, Lex, your learning is when you go out and look at buildings, you're gonna to say to yourself, that doesn't look right. Mm -hmm. You're getting the education to be able to pick up on these things. Yep, absolutely. Okay, um, Paul, if you would, go ahead and pull up your case study. So we're talking about renovations and we're talking about some issues with uh, you know, uh, flo the, the, the floors here and terrazzo floors, um, Main Street type of building. And Paul has a uh, uh, presentation he utilizes in his class that we're gonna share with you on this. I wanna get to that point. I have to share that screen, right? Yep. There you go. All right. Is that good? Yep. Nice. All right. So Take it away, Paul. The, the history of this building, um, it, it tells us right up top, uh, the building was built in, in 1910. I know you can't see that in the slide. Um, the, the occupancy prior to the laundromat was a restaurant, and we believe that's when uh, this renovation uh, occurred. I do want to give a plug for fire engineering training minutes. Um, this building was the subject of one of the training minutes uh, maybe seven or eight years ago. It was one of the first training minutes that I had done with fire engineering. So um, you can get a, a good look at this, uh, this building uh, on, on training minutes. But it's a, it's a typical, you know, Main Street America type building. It's ordinary construction. The uh, floor joists run from the B wall to the D wall. The rafters run the same way. There is this little uh, uh, Hollywood front on the building up top. It does, there is no pitch beyond that. It, it's all a flat roof. Uh, there is a center uh, column and beam or column and girder assembly that runs from the A wall to the C wall right down the center uh, of the building. So somewhere during the life of the building, um, they renovated the building and they took the wood floor up and put, poured concrete over the wood joist. Now, this photograph depicts the cast iron column in, or columns, there's a couple of columns in there. Uh, there's a, actually, I believe there's two column and beam assemblies. You can see the other column on the left. We're looking towards the A side uh, and then and moving towards the C side. And, and you can see a little bit in this photograph, if you look close at the, um, top of the column, uh, there's a, a crushing effect on the column. If you look up at the underside of the floor deck, you can see that this just doesn't look typical, like a typical um, wood joisted floor with a subfloor uh, laid on top of the joist. You can see that there are some furring strips as they're commonly called, or pieces of five quarter uh, nailed to the sides of each of the joists, both sides of the joist and, and what we believe they did was they took up the subflooring, the flooring, the subflooring, they, they held on to the subflooring and, and then cut it into 14, 14 and a half inch pieces and laid it on top of the furring strip. As you can see, this is the back third to back half of the building where they have uh, accomplished this, this renovation. And, and right away, if we're looking at this building, maybe we're here on a call, delayed ignition, or we're on a pre-plan inspection, a um, couple, of, couple of red flags, as the chief called them, is look at this floor. It's, it's out of the ordinary. Look at this column and beam or girder assembly that th this beam has crushed down uh, around the top of the columns and in more than one place. Um, so right away, there should be some red flags going off here on our minds. And if we continue to look around the basement, oh uh, we can see <laughs> where, uh, where 
plumbing renovation has occurred and it's exposed the concrete that has been poured uh, over the top or superimposed over this floor system. Uh, and this is, we're up on the first floor, we're looking out over uh, part of the area where when this was a restaurant, the kitchen was here. So uh, at least back uh, into the early 70s, I remember that restaurant being there. Um, so we, we really don't know when this renovation uh, occurred, uh, but it's there and it was there for a number of years. As I mentioned before we started recording, uh, just within the last uh, couple of weeks or month or so, uh, this building was demolished to make way for uh, some redevelopment. And, and here's where there was a, a, a utility poke through and you can see there's approximately four inches of concrete um, that's been poured over this original wood joist and floor. So combination of factors and, and Glenn mentioned um, one of the factors is, is the, the, the thermal camera. Um, that, that concrete floor, the thickness of that concrete floor does a couple of things. Um, it's going to add an insulating value to the floor. So it, it, even in the old days of, of uh, rubber boots, um, you're not going to feel the heat through that floor and through the rubber boot. Uh, it has added a tremendous amount of dead load to the building to the point where it has caused that, that column, that center uh, beam and girder assembly to crush down over the column. Um, so these are the kind of things that I think that we need to be in tune to. And, uh, you know, I've, uh, in the previous session, I talked a little bit about Rutherford. We're about uh, eight miles due west of uh, Manhattan, the Lincoln Tunnel. Um, we're certainly a bedroom community in New York City. Uh, we're by no means in, in an urban environment. Uh, most people in, would call us a suburban community. But uh, like most suburban communities, we, we've got a commercial district. And these, this is the type of building or, and occupancies that you're going to find in, in your commercial district that we all need to be alerted to. And, and once we understand the problems and, and, and inappropriate renovations that have occurred, you're going to find them in your jurisdiction. And, and as Glenn started to allude to, um, drugstores. So this condition might exist uh, in, in your old time drugstores. Now, drugstores today, I call them big box drugstores. They're the Walgreens, the CVSs, the Dwayne Reeds of the world. But uh, think about where, and ask the old timers, ask the previous generations of the fire service, ask uh, your local historian, where were the drugstores? They had a soda fountain counter in some of them. And they had terrazzo floor, which is, is that masonry element potentially imposed over those wood joists. And those conditions exist in those buildings. And that, that's, you know, excellent pre-plan information to have available in, in the event of a fire. Lex, go ahead and pull up the, the picture of the terrazzo floor. Um, Before you leave and you go to the floor, let me just point out a couple of things. And I'll post, uh, I'd like to post a question to Paul. Looking at the underside of the floor and looking at uh, these uh, substantial uh, beams, if you will, the wood seems to be stained. And why I'm saying that and what I'm alluding to is that maybe when this was a restaurant uh, and when they washed the floors, they may have used hoses, things like that. And in that picture, picture right there to the left, it almost looks like it was a drain that the pipe has been cut. So what I'm alluding to is that there was leaks and there was water uh, coming down and that degraded this wood as well, which may have also caused that beam uh, to let's say crush because now the weight of uh, the kitchen appliances, if you will, stoves, ovens, things like that, and refrigerators. Refrigerators are heavy. Uh, all added to the degradation of these beams down below. I had one of my units in the 49 Battalion out doing building inspection. They go into the basement of a fish door. Well, it is a fish door. And it had not a terrazzo floor, but it had a cement floor with tiles. But they had these long refrigerators where the fish is being displayed on ice. And that ice, where does the water go as the ice melts? It goes on the floor and it goes to the drains. But if the drains aren't uh, fixed that well to where that water is going off into the sewer, it's going on to the wood below and they had four or five beams that in other words this first floor was ready to collapse so those stains look like water stains from years of nobody paying attention yeah that that's a that's a huge issue i think that that's across the board is deterioration of the structure there's so many 
um, instances where there's been line of duty deaths and, and uh, significant injuries to members of the fire service where, where the building has, uh, it, it winds up in a deteriorated state from lack of maintenance. Uh, to give another plug to fire engineering training minutes, um, there's a, a trust, uh, a heavy timber trust revisited um, training minute, and, and that was the condition. The, the trusses were deteriorated, the, the roof deck was deteriorated, uh, same as this floor, as the chief points oh, out, you know, water damage over the years. Uh, Chicago, certainly could have an impact. Guys, Chicago lost a few firefighters some years ago in a trust that had water damage. Yeah. Yep, Glenn, an old laundromat. Uh, Glenn and uh, James, I want you to chime in on this. Lexi has put up a picture. Now, this just, this is a picture you can grab off of, you know, Google, uh, type in terrazzo floor. But because James is in the, 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 not only a firefighter, but he's a, a carpenter, he builds stuff. And Glenn, with your research, how, when we're doing walkthroughs of old drugstores and, and that, uh, you know, to take a look and see about that terrazzo floor like this, Glenn, how prevalent now, um, this isn't something that is still going on, correct? Are we... How far back or how old do you know, or, or James, that, that terrazzo flooring uh, or that heavy, thick concrete cake put on top of the wood beams, how far back would you see this in a building or, or what's its era? Still, so it's still really common practice to put uh, concrete topping slabs. A lot of times now it'll be lightweight uh, concrete that they use. Um, but it's still very, very common. I know Chief Tracy brought up the, the mass timber building that we have in Vancouver, the Brock Commons, that has a, has a concrete topping slab over all the cross-laminated timber panels. Uh, it, it happens mo a lot of time for sound um, in, in, you know, four to six story wood frame, or as uh, Glennie likes to say, toothpick towers. Uh, a lot of times those will have uh, lightweight topping slabs. Um, I'm sure uh, Glenn can go more into the history, but the, the terrazzo real, like for me, picking it out is really kind of what you see here is kind of the decorative feature of it by putting those, um, the flakes and stuff in there and then the polished look of it. Um, we've just gone away from, you know, kind of that craftsmanship part of it by trying to make it look good. It's easier to put tile or some other kind of feature on top or a lot of times now we'll see stamped concrete. Uh, but really the that concrete slabs are, are really still common um, that we see but the the big difference now is they may not be as thick like I know on the 23rd Street fire I believe it was five inches thick um, so a lot of times it'll be less than that um, but we're also dealing with structural members that are far far um, less robust I know Chief Tracy said three by ten but I was reading the division seven report it was actually three inch by 14 inch where the with a floor joist in that building. So um, we don't see anything remotely close to that now. Um, so although the concrete slab may be less thick, where structural members are far less robust, but I know, um, I'm sure Glenn has more of the history side of the, the terrazzo. Yeah, I just, I just add that, thanks James. I would just add that, you know, the terrazzo floors are really popular at the turn of the previous century, right up through World War One. I. I think the 20s and 30s, the 20s really was probably the height of these. They're incredibly decorative. I mean, that's why they're there. They're, they're not anything to do structurally. They're there just to look good. The problem, of course, for us is that they're the heaviest floor out there. And, and I guess one of the only benefit that we have today is that they're still very expensive to put in. So you don't see them a lot, but they're still going in now. I mean, it's not that it's completely disappeared. So if you have a high, you're not going to find this in Walgreens, okay, today. But, you know, if you've got a, a, you know, a significant signature project going up, uh, particularly a high rise or something like that, you might, in fact, um, or some corporate office building, you might actually see Terrazzo back again. So, and we can put this in the same category to tell you the truth of, of marble and some other things. I mean, Terrazzo is probably, if, I mean, Square foot per for square, cubic foot, I should say, cubic foot per cubic foot is probably the highest. But don't forget, I mean, there's, there's marble out there and other things. And again, the, the real big issue for us is not, is not just the weight. It's the fact that it conceals things. i just tell you a quick story. We had a fire several years ago in a very wealthy community next to mine. Um, we had a major fire in the basement. Um, this, was a, this was like, a, this was a McMansion. It was over 10,000 square foot house. And uh, basically, the fire extended through the entire basement from the, from the uh, garage 
area. And uh, the important point about it was that I could tell you looking in the front door of the house, we have four lines in the building and I was a safety officer. We pulled everybody out because they weren't making enough progress. And um, once we had the guys out about 10 minutes later, I noticed that the marble floor in the foyer area, and it was several hundred square feet of marble, the water that, that of course have been, as the hose lines were advanced, that was still in there was boiling on top of that, on top of that marble. So, you know, again, we think about this as a 1966 fire in a building, you know, that's probably 80 years earlier than that, but, or, or maybe 50 years earlier than that, I shouldn't say 80, but 50 years, but the key point is that the same kind of issues are still with us today. So, so yeah, it's an expensive floor, but they're still out there and new ones are being put in from time to time. So you just gotta be aware of it, that's all. Thank you. As, as we wrap up uh, this, um, Jerry, Chief Tracy, if you would, pull up those, uh, those 12 members again in your PowerPoint. Well, did I ever share with you uh, uh, the story of a chief that I worked under? Uh, when I was a firefighter in 108 truck, uh, he, he pulled us out of a, a store, if you will, that uh, it was a food store, uh, similar construction, a corner store. It had a poured concrete. It wasn't terrazzo, but it was a poured concrete floor. And the only stairs leading down into the basement were at the rear of the occupancy first floor. And they were open and unenclosed and they had burnt away. Uh, so the chief had asked us, meaning uh, 108 truck, could you cut a hole in the floor? And it caused me to change the blade on the K2 saw from uh, a forcible entry uh, to a uh, concrete blade, masonry blade, if you will. And we're in there and we're trying to, uh, let's say, put four cuts for the floor. And in the meantime, while we're in there cutting, the chief uh, was coming in uh, and he was, I thought, checking on our progress to see how we were doing. And at some point in time, you ordered everybody out of the building and how they attacked this fire was, uh, they had units go down into the exposure four basement, uh, the D side, breach a hole and they pumped uh, high X foam and that put the fire out. And then when the fire was out, uh, I had gone down into the basement to see where we were cutting versus where the fire was. And we were right over the fire. And those beams, floor beams were in fact three by tens and they were almost fully charred away. The, floor never collapsed. But when we went back to the firehouse later, uh, after overhaul and taken up, I went up to his office. I used to say, he used to stay up. He never went to bed, stay up late uh, talking. And I said, chief, what made you uh, order everybody out of the building? Well, when he first came in, what I didn't notice was he took a canned good off the shelf. It was a food store. Uh, he took a canned good off the shelf and he laid it down in the aisle next to, let's say the shelves. Uh, and he, every time he came in, and I thought he was monitoring our progress, he was looking at that can. And when he came in and he saw that the can moved, he knew that the floor beams were starting to sag, and that's when he ordered everybody out of the building. Can of corn. Can of corn on the floor. Exactly. Um, as this is, as we wrap this up, I want to do a couple things. First off, if everybody can see that, can you all see that? Can everybody see that picture? Yep. For our viewers, and, and again, this will be a podcast and uh, also, uh, it, you know, so uh, it'll be a webinar, video base, and a podcast. But that gentleman right there is Royal Fox. And Royal passed away uh, a, few year, a few months or last year. But this was a picture of him taken years ago at the anniversary of the 23rd Street fire. Wow. And like I said, Royal passed away, I want to say last year. I, I, I don't know for sure, but this picture was several years taken again at the 50th anniversary, I think. And that's Royal and his wife. I, I'll just say this and, and, and uh, I'm going to bring up the 12 again. This gentleman right here, if, if I could have meet somebody, and there's lots of people that I would want to meet in the fire service, it's this gentleman right here. And, and I'll be brief, but I'll say what he did there, as Chief Tracy mentioned, 
has always stuck with me and it is a tactic. Um, I get, sometimes I get um, uh, down on, on when I see firefighters that don't wanna learn. And, and that's why uh, we included Lex here because she's the rare, uh, you know, the rare student anymore. But anyway, um, one of the tips, a lot of times a lot of firefighters say, well, you know, what, why do I care about the history and, and why? And it's just the way I think a lot of uh, generations are now. But Royal Fox taught me something that to this day, I will never ever forget as long as I'm on the job and that is that him and the captain, I do not know his name off the top of my head, that was on engine five, that went down into the cellar, Royal Fox was on ladder three. They left a person at the top of the stairs, Nick Cicero, I believe his name was. And back then, that tactic was so before radios, you could warn everybody, you know, tell, keep the crews in the basement aware of what conditions were. And now that we have radios, Everybody wants to get down into the basement or get up into the attic. But this gentleman right here, that old school tactic, uh, saved 12 lives. Uh, they, they, this could have been a double, this could have been a double, a 24 member loss of life because there was 12, two companies down in the basement. But Royal Fox, when, the, when Nick Cicero was at the top of the stairs, he started to see when the collapse occurred towards what would be the C side of the drugstore, the stairs were at like the AB corner. He sees the boxes start to slide and he knows something's wrong. He starts yelling for the crews to get out, get out, get out. They start to get out. Royal Fox right here, he, he received a medal on medal day. Uh, there was just him and one other firefighter left in that cellar. And it, uh, the firefighters that escaped that cellar were badly burned. Um, they came out, according to the articles that I've read, smoking. And this was before turnout gear was what we have today. And Royal Fox pushed this, this young firefighter, let's just be honest, damn near threw a lot of fire and heat. And he sa saved his life and, and Royal was able to get out. I'll hurry up to my point. Not only was the top of the stairs the key, but Royal Fox was involved in a, in a similar event years prior in Manhattan from what I was reading. And that taught him to leave that, again, that person at the top of the stairs. It's a tactic that still we should do today that young members hearing my, our voices should adhere to no matter who has radios, who doesn't. Um, but this just, always has stuck with me and it's because Royal Fox did what a firefighter should do and that is learn from the past, move it forward and when they have jobs and when they have future events uh, and learn from those and, and no doubt that saved lives. Um, I, I just wanted to share that. I, Royal Fox is a true hero at this event and I really, uh, really admired what he did there. And as we finish up, um, anybody else have, I'll put the picture up here of those brave souls that were lost that day. And as we close out, James, do you have anything uh, you would like to add? Uh, no, I don't really think so. Uh, well, I, I will say it was kind of touched on a little bit, but um, those, you know, the major contributing factors to this um, incident are things that happen every single day throughout Canada and the United States. Um, renovations like this happen all the time, working in the construction trades. Um, I would see it all the time where a building would get finished, they would, the inspector would come and, and uh, and provide the occupancy and before the inspector was even away from the drive out the driveway um, there's changes being made that um, were not intended to be there so this stuff happens all the time so that you know that um, company inspections getting out and walking the districts um, is just so key and just and just constantly looking for these things because um, it's you know, not just not an it's not just an old time issue it's something that happens um, you know, super, super common today. And we don't have that same, you know, redundancy or we don't have that same um, mass in the structural members that we used to in a lot of cases. So it's, you know, even more, um, 
even more important. So I just want to say thanks for including me in as always, and uh, definitely learned a lot as always. Glenn, any closing thoughts, sir? Well, thanks, Joe, for having this today. Um, no, I think, uh, like I said, there's a lot of important points with, with um, James just mentioned is that uh, don't ever assume that any building is building code compliant. Don't ever assume the building department's gonna tell you what's going on. You gotta do your own reconnaissance. And I think the real responsibility is for, certainly for every firefighter, but particularly the company officers. I mean, again, a lot of folks don't like doing building inspections um, and perhaps putting pre-plans together, but use the time that you're in these buildings to your advantage to learn what's going on, to see what's in the building. We didn't really touch on the the hazardous materials aspect of this, but there was probably numerous fire code violations as well, besides uh, issues of the building itself. So again, we have to take a proactive role. Do not take a back seat, assuming someone else is gonna tell you about it. You have to take the, the lead role in a lot of this stuff. So um, that's really, I think to me, one of the important takeaways is that, again, it's, it's really up to every firefighter, and particularly the company officers to, to really be the ones in the lead on this. Thank you. Paul? Well, things, Chief. Uh, common occupancies. Another common occupancy for terrazzo floors is schools. Uh, I think just about all of our public schools have terrazzo. And I also recently discovered uh, fundamentally a faux terrazzo floor. Um, building up at the local college was renovated, and I walked in. I'm like, wow, they, you know, you guys uh, uh, sold terrazzo floors. And, and the contractor looked at me and said, no, not really. It's, uh, it was a three foot by three foot pile that looks like terrazzo is one inch thick, you know, set as tile is set uh, on the concrete floor. Um, there, there is also, there's a lot published, there's a lot on the web uh, about this fire, which I think is really important for us. Um, I, one of my hobbies, I guess, is, is the history of the fire service. And maybe Chief Tracy can add on this. Um, a, a couple of years ago, I came across, it was right around the anniversary of the fire. Um, Lieutenant, Peoria, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Um, his daughter, uh, they, they made a documentary uh, entitled My Father's House. Um, and I would encourage everyone to go out. It's on FDNY's foundation page. You can order the DVD um, online. Uh, it, there's really not a lot of technical information in there. It's, it's information from the heart. And, and it talks about how the FDNY honors uh, uh, those who have made the uh, supreme sacrifice. Shafe, is there anything that you would want to add on that? It was uh, uh, Lieutenant Fiore's daughter happened to go to, uh, let's say, the, the site. And the There's a marker there. That, um, looking at the plaque, and it wasn't on the anniversary uh, of the collapse, but she happened to be there. And I believe it might have been uh, three truck was out uh, and a conversation ensued. They realized that uh, she was the daughter and they brought her over to 18, squad 18, which was 18 engine. And from that, uh, they developed a strong uh, relationship together. Uh, and now she knows this is my father's house uh, and how squad 18, you know, still remembers, uh, let's say, those firefighters, as well as the firefighters from 9-11. I wanted to, uh, one, mention that, you know, we're talking a lot about building construction, uh, but uh, Glenn alluded to it as well. It goes beyond building construction, Lex. It also goes to, okay, what's inside the building? What's gonna burn? We're basically talking a box. You know, uh, people talk about uh, uh, topography, uh, the lay of the land, but what's inside the box, topology. And, you know, I alluded to the fact that the size of the box, but I like to think of building inspection. I, I wanted to get across to my firefighters at whatever rank I was at. We're going out, we're going into this building. We're going to take a look at this building as to what is the fire problem? We'll stand in front of it. Where's the hydrant? Where's my water source? What's my forcible entry challenge entering the building? How many lanes of hose do I need? But we're talking about what, are the contents. And now we're talking about uh, the volatility of contents, the heat release rates that these things can burn. 
And as uh, Glenn alluded to the fact that there was probably some uh, storage uh, safety violations. I mean, they had lacquer thinners and things like that. It's the heat release rate, the heat and the rate of release that's going to compromise the structural elements of the building. That's going to take that building down. And if we don't understand that along with building construction, how is this building going to be compromised by these fuels and the heat release rates? It's all encompassing. Well, thank you very much, brother, uh, Joe, for including me in this. It was an honor and an honor to be with the rest of these people and you too, Lex. Thank you. Lex, any words? And it really, you know, and again, we have Lex on here because she's the future of the fire service and it's important for us to give back um, <clears throat> to those that are coming up behind us. But it's also important to, you know, and to, and to mentor those that want to be mentored. And Lex is certainly that. And, and um, so that's why, you know, uh, she's the future. Uh, Lex, any any uh, thoughts or any anything you'd like to add to um, any younger firefighters like yourself watching this or listening to the podcast? Um, first of all, just thank you again for including me. I, I learned a lot and really appreciate it. But I would suggest for any newer firefighter, and you listen to these podcasts and you read your books and you study, that's great. That's the first step. But you're really not going to understand what any of it means until you get into your own buildings and see it for yourself. And when you do that and you get out there, if there's something you see and you don't understand, take pictures, take them back to your senior guys or your officers. You know, if they don't know, then send it to someone else. And that's really how you're going to learn your districts and really fully understand what this building means to you. So. Okay. Uh, that wraps up this edition of uh, the Building Construction Awareness Project. We look for us, uh, we're going to do uh, try to do one we're going to do one for sure every quarter uh in 2021 uh we will also look to maybe do a special one here and there on a particular fire like the 23rd street fire and as always if, if anybody has any questions or any thoughts or any suggestions um my email will be in the uh the write-up on this feel free to reach out so uh thank hey, you everybody joe. for being a part of this hey joe just one last thing yeah. Um, yep. I just want to give a little shout out. Uh, yesterday, we got some horrible news that uh, firefighter Jason Cortez from the San Francisco Fire Department died in, uh, in the line of duty at a training event. He fell from the training tower there. 13-year uh, guy, worked on a busy engine, 42 years old, left a couple kids behind. So um, I just, uh, I've, got, I've got a number of friends who work for uh, San Francisco near and dear to my heart. So I just wanted to, uh, you know, put, put that out there for everyone to... Um, kind of put San Francisco in their uh, thoughts and prayers and uh, in the family of uh, Firefighter Cortez. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Bob.